Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, my name is CL Vaughan, and I'll be your host for this morning's event. This is the fifth installment of our Maasai Mara Conservation Communities and Cattle Series from Share Screen Africa. I wanted to say a really, really warm welcome to everybody joining us. Thank you as well for those people who've put where they're joining from in the chat. We'd love to hear where everybody's coming from, and we really look forward to the discussion at the end of this session. So we are just waiting for our primary audience, the Wildlife Tourism College from the Maasai Mara to join. I'm hoping that they will join us shortly and they'll be involved as well in the Q&A at the end. So first of all, I'm just going to start by giving an introduction to our speakers today. And then once our speakers have given their talk, we will be having a question and answer session at the end. Um, as always, if you do have any questions, um, throughout the talk, feel free to pop them in the chat and I will read them out at the end. Or alternatively, once um, Alistair and Dixon have given their talk, you can turn your camera on and wave at me or you can use the um, Zoom function to raise your hand if you'd like to answer your question out loud. So without further ado, we've got two wonderful speakers this morning talking to us about the Mara Naibosho Conservancy. Our first speaker today is Mr. Alistair Nicklin. Um, Alistair was born and raised in Kenya and grew up surrounded by wildlife. Um, Alistair is a really passionate about preserving the incomparable and astonishing, but sadly very fast vanishing biodiversity of Africa. Um, he's got professional careers that span across agriculture, tourism and conservation. And Alistair is the current manage general manager of the Nobosha Conservancy, which is a 55,000 acre community owned conservancy in the Mara ecosystem. Um, he's also the owner of Latere Clean Energy and describes himself on LinkedIn. Sorry, Alistair, stole that from you as a conservationist and an optimist, which is what we want from our speakers. Um, and our second speaker today is Dixon and Kita. Dixon is a native of the Maasai Mara. He spent his early years herding livestock in what is now the Nobosha Conservancy, which is where he ignited his passion for coexistence of livestock and wild animals. He then pursued a degree in tourism and conservation at the Maasai Mara University and currently serves as the conservancy manager at Nabosho. Um, Dixon is an assertive go-getter with an ardent passion in community and conservation and thinking about how these two can be integrated. So a very, very warm welcome to our two speakers today. Thank you both so much for doing this for us. And I am going to be quiet now and let you guys give your talk. Thank you. CL, thank you very much um, for the introduction and to Share Screen Africa for the opportunity to talk about Nabosho. Um, there's definitely a lot to, to say about Nabosho um, and, and where it started and where it is now, from where it started and, and where we are now. So I'll actually hand a lot of that over to, to Dixon um, because... Um, as you mentioned, he's from the area and has seen it from basically when he was born to, to where Naibosho is in 2023. Um, as general manager, it truly is a privilege to be part of the Mara ecosystem conservancy movement. Um, a very fast moving, dynamic, um, but challenging environment to work in. So shoot, just to kick it off is um, a lot of you who are listening in already know this, but for those that don't, um, Nabosho is um, now one conservancy of 24 outside of the National Reserve. If you see my laser pointer, that where I'm squiggling around now is Nabosho. Last week, you had a talk from Jackson um, at Paramat, and um, all the students are listening in from today. And it's actually a real privilege to have a young cadre of people joining um, to um, better understand what's going on here because you are the next generation. Um, and this is really important. Um, so instead of um, being looking at things in a doom and gloom and a fast diminishing biodiversity, actually what we're seeing with these conservancies is is a reversal that there is there is immense hope and looking at the the land mass area we're 55,000 acres with all these conservancies combined we basically double the the land area of the, the reserve um, to create one large block um, 
for the students um, that are listening, I do have a question for you to answer at the end, and I'm interested to see who provides the right answer. And that is how much grass does an average cow in the Mara ecosystem need to eat a day? Not just to survive, but what's the average amount of grass a cow will need to eat in a day? So we'll get to that later on in, in, in the presentation of, of how Naibosho um, is, is a wildlife area, but also is a cattle grazing zone for the, for, for the, for the community. So as Ciel said, we're, depending on where you are in the world, we work in hectares um, and acres, so 22,313 hectares currently. We have expanded a little this year. Uh, it is community-owned wildlife conservancy. So the 100% of the conservancy is owned by over 700 landowners who have agreed to lease their land for the next 25 years. Uh, established in 2010, which is relatively not too long ago, um, Naibosha, Naibosha was one of the, the first um, conservancies and one of the more established in, in, in the GME uh, Great Mara ecosystem. Uh, we're dedicated to preserving the, the extraordinary, the Mara is an extraordinary uh, part of the world for, for wildlife. Um, biodiversity. Um, it is an opportunity to preserve that, but at the same time improve the livelihoods of the community. Um, this is this is what is the critical aspect about uh, community-owned conservancies: is that wildlife can pay. Um, so, with that, on Nabosha, we have five different tourism partners and eight camps between them, um, because we don't have overcrowding. That is often associated with the Mara Reserve, that there is a limit of 150 beds in the conservancy between the tourism partners, and that keeps things in check. But within that, uh, with the five tourism partners, um, that basically is the main financial funding mechanism for, for paying leases and um, management costs. So within that, we, we have a fairly strict code of conduct, um, high level of guiding. People that do visit Naibosha have an extraordinary wildlife um, experience. And a lot of that comes from not only just being able to see wildlife that's um, not running off or difficult, or um, it's also the guides that are on Naibosha that, that, that doing their role is, is showing people what, what Naibosha is, but also, um, I'd say 98% of the guides, and this is where it joined, um, is pertinent to those listening in from WTC, is are from the local area. They all went through the Koyaki, Koyaki Guiding School. Um, so, you know, it, it keeps it all in-house, but in a way that, that is at a high level of professionalism on a par with pretty much anywhere you can think of in Africa in terms of wildlife viewing. Um, with that, being that it's community owned, 700 plus landowners, the, the unique model along with some other conservancies in the Murray is that we allow grazing in managed areas. So not only do the community receive money from um, lease, a uh, monthly lease payment, but being able to graze cattle is, is another source of livelihood and also um, maintains the 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 cultural integrity of, of the Maasai. Um, that this slide just shows a pretty map of Naibosho, uh, some of the contours, I'm not sure if you can see it. Um, this is more of a strategic, the red, the red dots are where the camps are, all the uh, black dots are, uh, we have 10 different ranger stations, including a headquarter, um, headquarters which, um, the critical part of 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 when uh, you know Naibosho's management is that we need we need quite a large force of people protecting the land and making sure that the um, the health of the ecosystem is 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 in check. So I'm going to hand over to Dixon now um, to talk about the history of Naibosho and appropriately because he's actually from there. So Dixon, could you take over from here? 
Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Alistair, for give us some for giving us some synopsis on uh, um, what Naboisha is all about. And uh, thank you so much, everybody, for choosing to also use Naboisha Conservancy as a case to learn about the Mara ecosystem and uh, and the conservation model. Um, just but to mention before giving any history about Naboisha Conservancy is that um, you know the Mara ecosystem. You know, they say that 65% um, of the landscape within the Mara ecosystem is out of the protected area, that is Masai Mara Game Reserve. So Masai Mara is 1,810 square kilometers, and that tells that, uh, you know, the unprotected area then, before the conservancies, was 3,300 plus square kilometers. So you can basically tell that there was a need to sit down as stakeholders and people who mind so much about biodiversity and um, and the livelihood of the people to see whether they can protect the 65% of the landscape. So that by itself ne necessitated the essence of coming up with the all the other conservancies within the Mara ecosystem. So Nabosho Conservancy was one of the conservancies that was started, you know, um, back in the year, 2010, as a result of land demarcation. So, um, Koyeki Group Ranch, where Nabosho Conservancy um, is situated, was demarcated and each of the landowner was given a piece of a title deed. That means a sense of ownership. And now you are free to use your piece of land the way you so wishes. And um, so that, that that freedom was given to every community member. Now you have a title deed, you can do what you want. And um, as, as you can see from the map, as shown by Alistair, you, you, you can tell how many people that are right inside that map. These are like 700 people. These are 700 blocks or parcels that you can see. Each with, um, you know, with, 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 the, with the parcel number as indicated, so there are more than 700 title deeds here because you find one landowner probably has one or two titles or one or two parcels. So it is how it is. Though when you come to the ground, you might not see all this. This is only at least myself who can know that it's made up of various parcels. If you look at it from outside, you just see like one big map that looks like the map of Kenya, as you can see, 55,000 acres. And, uh, <clears throat> but right inside, if you like get into it, you see that, you know, you will profile it to different title, the different parcels and owned by more than 700 people. But look at the map now here without now, you know, the subdivision into different parcels. So the conservancy is owned by more than 700 people, but these people saw it good to bring their title together. Um, and leave it as a block without interfering with, you know, by coming up with different settlement to come up with the conservation model. So Nabosho is here today as a result of 700 people coming together, put their land together and continue, continue using it for, for conservation. Important to note that ownership does not change. The only thing that changes is that you're not residing at your parcel at the moment. You've decided to freely give it out to be used for conservation, you know, for us to conserve this area for generations to come and also for this community to get some benefits. So it's part of the Koyaki Group Ranch. Within the Koyaki Group Ranch, it was quite a big group ranch uh, where Mara North as a conservancy uh, is also part of the Koyaki Group Ranch. Olare Motoroki Conservancy is part of the Koyaki Group Ranch. Olerai Conservancy is part of the Koyaki Group Ranch. Nabosho Conservancy is part of uh, the Koyaki Group Ranch. Um, Paradamat Conservation Area is part of the group ranch, and National Life Conservation Area is also part of the group ranch. So you would imagine now that group ranch without these conservancies, what would have happened, you know, to the future of conservation in the Mara? What will happen? What will have happened even to the economy of these people who are entirely dependent right now on something that is coming out of conservation? So there was quite a need. And we appreciate the players who are here before, um, you know, who contributed um, to the to the to the to the to the starting of these conservancies. The other slide before before this, Alistair. Before the map. Before the map. 
Yeah, here. So, that um, one? sorry? Yeah, here. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, um, Nabosho, the, so this one was a group branch before, before it was a group branch, like a whole group not demarcated on communally. So after 2006, it's no longer communally on, but individually on. So there was quite a need to sit and see whether, you know, we can conserve. Otherwise, failure to that, people would have started uh, selling land. We all know the history of how the Maasai is probably lost so many other lands outside here. Um, and even today, some areas that is out, out of the, the already conserved area, you know, people have sold it off. They're no longer owning people. Some people are already running to some shopping, some you know, shopping centers, some towns to live because they don't have land anymore. So you can you can already tell how important it was to create you know the conservancy in the manner. So um, the people realize that tourism is of great importance. Let me just explain something that for those of you who happen to have been in the manner. Uh, before 2006, for example, 20 years down the line, you know how it looks like. Um, the only revenue that was coming through tourism was coming from the Masai Mara Game Reserve. And I'm sorry to mention that everything that was coming out of the Mara Reserve was only going to the government. And you remember, then there was no county government, there was no devolved government. So all this money was going to the national government in Nairobi. Nothing was coming to develop you know, this area, nothing was coming to impact a life, you know, of the people who are living on a daily basis with this wildlife. These are the people who know the value of a wild beast. These are the people who know the value of the lions in the Mara. But you see, there was, there were no, there was, there were, they were not getting anything tangible. You know, nothing was coming back to empower and affect, you know, and affect their economy. So there was that need where people sat down and said, oh, how really are we going to make this community to, to also enjoy, you know, something out of out, out of the existing resource, well of resource already in the manner. So um, to continue, Nabosho means people coming together. It's a Maasai term. So because land has already been subdivided and people owning individually, there was a need for people to sit and say, oh, can we really come back together? Even though land has really, you know, land demarcation has made us, has indicated that we should part ways and own our land individually, but can we come together? So we brought our land together. I am one of the landowners. We come, we came together, you know, um, amalgamated our pieces of land again uh, through signing of leases and starting of Nabosho Conservancy. So that is what Nabosho Conservancy means. People coming together, 700 people, 700 landowners came together to start the conservancy. So how does Nabosho conservancy work? Alistair did mention, um, you know, uh, during his introductory statements that we are community on as a conservancy. So it's not like a conservation, it's not like conservation profit make, making. This is 100% community on. The land belongs to us. The wildlife that are here has not been affected in any way. Only that we've surrendered our land, we've partnered with some investors who will come with some tourists to do game drive in our land, to see our, our uh, you know, the wildlife resource around here, and for us as a community to also get something in return. Remember, with or without the conservancies, these animals are still in our land. So there was a need for us to also benefit from the existence of this wildlife. Even those who, are not, who have not already surrendered their pieces of land to conservation. They're having this wildlife in their pieces of land every day. They have elephants destroying their fences. They have giraffes. They have, you know, all sorts of animals outside there, but they're not getting money. They're not getting resources, you see? So there was that need to, to bring that conservation model for you to benefit, for you to have direct benefits, indirect benefits, and all that. So this one, has a management company, the management company invoices tourism partners each month. So what that means is that we are under, you know, the conservancy, there is a governance model, and I'm not going to talk about it at this time, but there is a company that is owned by, that is equally managed by the landowners and the tourism investors. And this is a company that invoices for 
all the operational costs, including leases from the tourism investors for them to, to be able to run the conservancy effectively. Before that, Alistair? Well, yeah, this is just an example of what he's talking about. Um, fine, thank you. So this is exactly what Alistair, what I was mentioning about. Uh, this is how our, 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 our structure looks like. Look at Nabucho Conservancy 700 landowners, which is 22,500 hectares. So the people, the summit, the landowner summit is at the epic, is right um, you know, up there. And this is the main decision making. So right below, you can see that there is a land holding company that has been registered you know, for the landowners. So this is only entirely for the landowners. These are the people who are holding leases for all the 700 landowners or for the 22,500 hectares. And this company has people elected by the landowners to represent them, you know, to discuss their daily, their issues, to solve their disputes, whatever disputes that might emanate, you know, from the people. Remember, having 700 people coming together is not also easy. There are some issues that arise on a daily basis. So we've got a landholding company that holds leases, that also has a board to discuss their issues. And then now we have what we call the Mana Nabosho Company. This is um, a company that has three directors from the landholding company, three directors from um, you know, the tourism investors, and also has an independent chairman. So the six, three landowners, three investors will sit and um, appoint one director, um, you know, one independent chairman, somebody with no interest, no land, no investment, so that he can sit right in between both parties and arbitrate. So you can clearly tell, because now Manco is the main decision making, is the company that is running the conservancy. So even the landowners um, has a voice, have a voice at the main decision making, um, you know, company, at the conservancy because they are equally represented as the investors. So you can see that we have a general manager who is a lister, and then I'm also working as a conservancy manager. And we have so many other staff. We have more than 80 staff. And maybe I'll mention that one when it comes to you know some benefits sharing model. Yeah. Before this, Alistair, the other bullet points before this. Yeah, yeah. So you can see that. Um, each of the landowners receives a payment mon monthly directly to their bank account. Let me mention something here. Um, there was, you know, people sat down and said, how well should we share the revenue that is coming out of the conservancies? You know, people have different ideas. Should we like just have collect based on the people sleeping or spending a night in the conservancy and equally share? Or should we charge like some dollars per bed night? Or what shall we do? But people resulted to come up with what they call the guaranteed revenue scheme, whereby we agree on how much amount of money that you should pay me on a daily basis. Should we make it like to look like a salary? So there was that need. And people say, why are? Because our people are not learned you know, the literacy rate might be quite a little bit high. We need to have a clear way whereby they are benefiting, which is quite very clear. So even if you've not gone to school, you know that between the 28th and 1st of every month, I'm expecting this amount of money from Nabucho Conservancy without fail. And even if he receives like a thousand shillings less, he knows that there is a community liaison officer that I'm going to take hold of him and ask, why have I received less than a thousand shillings? But you see, with the collection of dollars and all that, it's not predictable. Sometimes it's low season, sometimes it's high season. You know, we have some effects like that of COVID and all that. But with a guaranteed revenue scheme, with or without guest, you are a hundred percent sure of, of, of that particular amount of money. So we um, you know, so the board, the land holding company, in discussion with the investors, agreed that they should be paying landowners on a on a on a guaranteed revenue scheme. Another advantage of the guarantee revenue is that they'll be entitled to get even loans and all that to develop themselves from the bank because you have a clear revenue coming at the end of every month. And we lobbied and, and, and discussed with the bank for a check-off scheme. So there's no difference between an abortion conservancy landowner and a government permanently employed employee. 
You see? So when, when you go to the bank and, you know, they see that you are an abortion conservancy landowner or community member or landowner for that matter, and I go as a government-employed person, there's no difference because that landowner already is assured of a revenue for the next 25 years, you see? And when you're working for the government, they also know that if, if I give you a 10 years loan, you will pay back. So there's no difference between that. So that by itself has really helped uh, our, our community so much because they're guaranteed you can get a million Kenya shilling. You can get like up to 1.2 million shillings. That is what we've negotiated as a loan that you will pay within the next five years. Remember, they're only committing like 50 percent of, of, of what you're getting. So you get 50 percent, then 50 percent will pay the loan. So that, that one has really be, helped the people to develop themselves, to take their kids to school, and also to build houses and all that. So another thing is that um, an average landowner in Abosho Conservancy has 60 hectares, and that is a, the amount that we pay, 42,095 Kenya shillings per month, which is like 500,000 Kenya shillings per year. We also allow grazing. Remember, we are talking about pastoralists. Remember, we are talking about a community that, you know, with or without money, if it, it doesn't matter how rich they are. It's prestigious, it's cultural to own livestock. So as a conservancy, we saw it good to, you know, integrate wildlife together with livestock, to, give, to allow this community to also do free-range grazing. It's another way of not, like, bringing up a conservation model that interferes with the cultural aspect of the community. The conservancy model did not come to interfere with the people's way of life. The conservancy did not come to say, oh, you mass size, now we have a conservancy. Are you not going to, please now stop putting livestock? No, we are here as a conservancy and want to help you manage your livestock better, want to help you, you know, continue your way of life without eroding anything. We are here to promote culture. We are here to promote conservation. The Maasai people have been, you know, known as conservationists, you know, conserving wildlife. Go to Amboseli, who are doing, who are, who are, who are, who are doing uh, conservation in Amboseli. These are the Maasai. Go to Samburu, go to Laikipia, come to Narok, Maasai Mara. All these are Maasai. Go to Tanzania. These are Maasai. So these are people that even with their livestock, they can still do conservation. So Nabojo Conservancy came to bring modern ideas on how to continue you know, conservation and livestock at the same time. So we allow control grazing to our people, only that we are having a challenge of the numbers that has go high. And what has brought the numbers high? What exactly has ignited their numbers to go high is the empowered economy. Because of the alternative sources of livelihood that we've provided in the name of conservation. So I'm not going to discuss that because it's, it's, it's a big topic, but please note that even if today we, 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 we analyze you know, when Abosho Conservancy was starting, we had like 5,000 head of cattle. But today we are managing close to 17,000. What has brought that massive difference of an increase of more than 1,000 cattle every year? Within the, for the last 13 years, so that means we've been increasing 1,000 cattle every year. This is because the community now is a better economy. They are not like how our fathers used to be. So today they are better. So another thing is that... 95% of the plots that we have as a conservancy have been signed into 25 years lease. When Nabosho started in 2010, we signed for a 15 years lease. That's the time that I was finishing my high school and we were convinced to sign for a, for a 15 years lease. It was quite very hard. It was quite very difficult. People had different perceptions. Why are we really not going to be you know, led into you know, there, there is this mindset that people have been telling us that the first, one of the elders of the Maasai called Lenana, when he signed some agreement with some white men and all that, he signed 99 years agreement for land, but people were tricked, but he was tricked like to add another nine. I don't know how true it is. Then so out of 99, it was changed to 999. So it was quite very clear within the Maasai community that something like that happened in life. I don't know when. So when we were negotiating and signing for 15 years lease, people had questions. Are we really not going to be looped into 150 years instead of 15 by adding a zero at the end? 
So there was no trust. But after people signing for 15 years, after 10 years, they realized, oh, nothing is changing. Looks like this land still belongs to us. Nothing has interfered our livestock. The numbers has gone high. We are getting a revenue. We're getting some support for the students. We're getting some infrastructural development. This, this idea looks good. Land, I, even my title deed is still at home. The conservancy is not taking a title deed. No, we are only signing a lease. So when we went back to them to think of, you know, committing this land for another 20 years on top of the, or the five remaining to be 25 years, it was not that hard. And that's why if you look at, and that's why today we are, we are, we are happy that 95% of the landowners have already committed for 25 years lease. So just imagine a people who had questions on signing land for 15 years have already com com committed their land again for 25 years, 95% of them. So you can, you can tell the trust has already grown. You can tell that even the benefit is already benefiting them. You can tell that even when, without talking of revenue, even their livestock, even their way of life, even the, the education, even education, it has really been supported. Even the students that we are giving a presentation today, um, the tourism um, and wildlife, the wildlife tourism college students would not, would not have been here today if not the conservation model. This, these students are here today because the community has been empowered to think positively about conservation. 15 years ago, you will not get anybody having an idea of going to school to study anything about tourism and conservation. But go to a class today. Ask them questions. What do you want to become in life? I want to be a conservationist. I want to, I want to work in the tourism industry. I want to be a tour guide. Why? Because, you know, the success rate of the people in the Mara who have gone to school to study tourism and conservation is way above any other person who has gone to, you know, to study any other field. So you can tell how impactful the conservation model has been to the life of the people living within the Mara. So next. Dixon, can I just uh, jump in yeah. quickly? Yeah, please. There's that. That was a really great, um, really great overview of the history. And going back to how you talked about um, communication is critical. It was back then and it is now. Um, transparency is also critical. So this governance structure um, is, is, is holding together uh, very well because of, look at all these arrows. We're all talking to each other all the time. From management company to landowners, back to the landowner company, back to the general manager, the consultancy. This area here is where there's a high level of communication traffic. That creates a that more efficient um, uh, system whereby nobody's in the dock. We share all financial details um, with, with the landowners. Um, we face the, ch the same challenges. Basically, there is no dis disconnect in, in that, which is critical to have, to have that continue. I think what is also interesting is that Land, Land Co or, or the Nambosha landowners have just formed a trust um, this year, which um, will, in, will enable further um, rights to every single individual landowner to, 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 their, to their say within the conservancy. But I just wanted to touch on that communication aspect. Um, I think, Dixon, if we talk about it's not just a lease payment, there are so many benefits to being a landowner on La Bosho, um, yes. or even if you're not a landowner. And um, I'll um, go ahead on this one because I think there's some extraordinary aspects to Nabosha that, yeah. that enhance the community benefits. Yeah. So thank you so much, Alistair. And just to continue with this, um, you know, I had already mentioned about the guaranteed revenue that our people are getting as a result of committing the land for conservation for the next 25 years. And uh, that is, uh, that's something unique because from where I come from in Kenya, it's not quite easy to get somebody getting a salary at home. Um, you, you just sit there looking after your kettle and then at the end of the month, you go to the bank and get some salaries. It's not easy, especially to a community who have not really been supported to go to school. These are people who have been so much confined to livestock keeping, pastoralism and nomadism, moving from one place to another, 
you know, without getting, you know, um, official or, um, you know, the, 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 you know, the proper education and all that, you know, the first generation probably to, to get education are people of our age. So anybody who is above 40, 90, 95, 90 to 99% of people have not gone to school. So the young, the youth, those below 35 years are the only people who have gotten education. So you will imagine about that. So getting somebody who have never been to school, getting money at the end of the month to go to school. So even if you have like 10 cows, you're not going to sell them anymore. You just need to look at them, probably sell ones in two or three years. So that by itself, um, you know, supports you, um, you know, to, to empower, to get empowered and to grow. You know, another thing is that, look at the grazing today. You know, you know, they say that the best conservation model in, in the world is where, you know, community is involved. So you will not think of coming up with a conservation model that evict people without evicting them physically, but you evict and erode their culture. You know, you disconnect them from their economic life. So Nabucho Conservancy does not have that, is, you know, that idea. We are here to support their way of life. The Conservancy is here to support the Maasai community of life. Yes, we are aware that you have your 100 cows. How are we really going to ensure that we are freely grazing without interfering with biodiversity? That's what we are thinking. That's the objective of the Conservancy. Even if you talk about 20 years from now, we are still thinking of, you know, managing livestock together with biodiversity without any of the in, in any of the parties affecting the other. So that is so good. And I, I know the community used to do that also. You know, there's a way the Maasai were also doing grazing, even, even though they were not like thinking about biodiversity, but there's a way they, they were doing their grazing. They're also doing control grazing. So they were not just grazing freely, you know, degrading land and all that. They're also thinking like, can we all settle in one area so that we can do free grazing without like putting settlement everywhere? So we are here as a conservancy to continue that. Um, we also have a social funds of bursary that we are providing to students. You can note that from, from the screen that we provide 12 million, you know, bursary. We've budgeted for 12 million, million to support 1,094 students, okay, right now. It's quite interesting. We started small, but today we are able to provide more than 1,094 students. And this is once, and we provide this money twice a year. So these students, we can give up to 2,200 students every year bursaries as a conservancy. This is quite very unique. Remember, this is something that is coming because you've decided also to do, um, to do, to do, to do, you've also decided to do conservation. Okay. Without the conservation model, will we really? Um, be getting that amount of money going to our schools. Remember, the 12 million is going to education, nothing else. And these are colleges, these are universities and high school. So just imagine how the future of this community will be tomorrow. You know, if all the conservancies and the government probably put the effort that Nabosho Conservancy is putting to support education. This is something important to note that this is an entire, you know, budget that the county government in history has budgeted for a whole world. When I'm talking about a word, you know, I did mention six conservancies that are on, only in Koyaki Group Ranch. Koyaki Group Ranch alone is not even like 30% of the world that we are in. We already have Siena Group Ranch. We already have, we have Olkinye Group Ranch. We have Siena Group Ranch and Koyaki Group Ranch. So one group ranch, one conservancy in a group ranch is already providing bursaries to its landowners, equating to what the county government has budgeted for the three group ranges. So you can tell that the conservancy can impact life, can support education more than the existing government. And we've been challenging to our friends in other conservancies, we've been talking even to, 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 to those in government to put more effort in, 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 in providing you know, bursaries and social funds to students, to needy students, for them to be able you know, to study and go to school. Uh, another thing is that we also try as much as we can to compensate, you know, the damages, you know, the, the, the challenges that we get out of, um, 
you know, the, the predation. So we compensate. This is entirely something that the government is supposed to be doing. This is a Kenya Wildlife Service role. In fact, for us, we say consolation, not compensation, because we're only saying poly, we're only saying sorry, we're only consoling as you wait for, you know, the county government, for the national government through KWS to co compensate you. But because of the bureaucratic and tedious processes of government, probably, the consequences are coming in to supplement that, to make sure that there is a cordial relationship between our life, our people and wildlife. So that as a landowner, I should stop seeing a lion as a destroyer of property, as an enemy, but as a, I see a lion as, as an important you know, animal. Look at this today. The same lion is providing you a graded revenue at the end of every month. The same lion is paying for your cow when they eat. The same lion is supporting your kid to go to school every time. You see, the same lion is providing employment to the students who have already been supported through the conservancies to go to school. How will the community think about the lion? Just think about that. The same lion who has provided a myriad of, um, you know, a wide range of benefits to that particular family, how will that family think about that lion? I want to tell you today, the reason why human wildlife conflicts, especially where people are killing lions like how they used to be, has gone down. We are not recording those cases again. Why? Because today we are getting benefits from the same lions. Today we are getting benefits from, 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 from wild beasts. It's only in the matter that people say that wild beasts are paying for rent to be in your chamber, to be in your land. They are all rightfully supposed to be in your land because they are bringing all the benefits that you're supposed to be getting. So another thing is that we have so many other community initiatives. Look at employment, sorry. Employment. Nabucho Conservancy, from the chart, from you know the organogram that was shared, we have more than 80 staff. I would say that 99% are local people. We have close to 400 other people working in our camps. Our policy is that 80% should be local. Why are we really saying local? We are saying because these are the people who know the value of conservation. These are the people who know the value of keeping these animals. These are the people who also sacrifice their land into conservation. It's not bad. It's not a bad idea to give back into the same community what they're supposed to be given. We're not saying that other people from other parts of this country and this world are not supposed to work. No, but please, is it possible for us to give an opportunity back to the local? This is what we've been doing as a conservancy. And you can see now one of the other reasons why the same community decided to commit their land for a further 25 years because of all these benefits. So that is what, that, that is the benefit sharing model. This, as you can tell, today when you go to school, when you go to this community, something else that I did not mention is some, some infrastructure development that the consumer has done. In each of the nine sections that our landowners are in today, the consumer has supported either a classroom or probably um, you know, uh, a structure in one of the hospitals. Or, or, or health centers. That's what we've done. In Koilale, for example, we've done a classroom in Nabosho. We started Nabosho Primary School. And today, Nabosho Primary School, you know, when we started, you know, today, within six, seven years, has more than 500 students. But Nabosho Conservancy started. In Ulesere, one of the other community areas, we supported the hospital. You see, when you go to Talek, we supported a classroom. So we've done in each of the clusters how we've classified in how we've clustered, we've clustered based on where our landowners are coming from. And we've done at least something small. We've, prof, prof, we've supported a water project in um, Ololchura, where our landowners are coming from. We've supported last year another project, you know, to rehabilitate some water in, in Irban and so many other things. So that clearly tells that the Conservancy has gone you know, to an extra mile of also thinking about how you are stay is in at home by supporting school, supporting the health centers and all that. We've also supported even the road network, try to connect all that. 
So the conservancy has really been quite of a great help to the community. Next. So maybe I'll hand over back to Alistair to discuss about wildlife and biodiversity. And if I happen to get some, something else to share on the process, I'll, I'll come back. Thanks, Dixon. That, that was great. And I realized that we're probably running over a little bit. So um, I'll, I'll be quick, but I think it's important to understand that the conservancy is 55,000 acres. That's just Naibosho. Uh, we share common borders with other conservancies like Olaria Rock, um, Nashulai, we corridors down to the reserve. But 55,000 acres in of itself is a sizable area of land um, to manage, and it hosts a huge amount of wildlife. Um, in context, it's, it's about the same, if not slightly larger than Lewa, um, for those that know Lycopia. The wildlife corridors are critical. Um, we have no fencing on Naibosho at all. Um, in fact, uh, if any landowner in the host parcel puts up a fence, that's discouraged. Um, we work very closely uh, with KWS um, and other organizations, um, a large number of organizations, the Mara Predator Program, uh, Kenya Bird of Prey Trust, Mara Raptor Project, um, Edu Africa. Um, I see Stu's still uh, still on the chat. You know, we have volunteers who are probably listening in um, that contribute to uh, wildlife monitoring. Um, we have three students right now. I don't know if they've also joined from Wakanekin University doing their masters and um, all combined, we get a lot of collaboration. Um, through this to to enhance the biodiversity uh, or, and maintain the integrity of the ecosystem. It is a safe haven for wildlife. Um, and you can tell that when you come and visit Naibosho, um, it, it, it is an extraordinary experience, um, especially in, in our core area where it's often like the Garden of Eden. You, you drive around and the, the harmony between the wildlife uh, or is 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 is, is almost incomparable. Um, having been a guide for multiple years, it would have been a dream to have gone to Naibosha 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so we tourism is the major contributor, um, but what we are trying to prove, especially through scientific con contribution, is that these, these conservancies are extremely valuable on a global level, they they need supporting, even if you took tourism out, that they maintain, they, they still are a conservancy. The, these, we're, we're in the world losing large tracts of land um, to, to overpopulation, the land pressure is immense. Um, what we're proving on places like Nabosha is that actually conservation pays and we're creating a, a, a huge amount of benefits for for the wildlife. Without without a conservancy, there would be fences all over Naibosho. There would be probably ten percent of the uh, fauna spe uh, species, um, and you'd have seen a massive drop in biodiversity. So it's it's um, from a conservation standpoint, extremely important. So the motivator for 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 me as a general manager is to keep that biodiversity to 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 protect it and by doing so improve the livelihoods of the community that actually own the land that the wildlife is on um you know there's 2023 we're we're, we're, we're dealing with a lot of new technology um we're about to start using earth ranger for um, more um, efficient wildlife and vegetation monitoring um, I'm not doing enough justice to the other partners we have. Um, the range and education um, is, a, is, is a large part of understanding of what the resources are. Um, erosion control, land restoration. It, it all starts with healthy soils and healthy grass. So a rangeland um, can be defined in many ways, but one of the characteristics of a rangeland is that evaporation exceeds precipitation. So preserving the grasses is critical. Um, most of the nutrients at the top level of the, of the soil horizon um, and, and 
if those are denuded or washed away from overgrazing, and I'll show you pictures in, in a little bit in, in the next few slides of what can happen and why it's critical to manage um, a rangeland, um, is that you'll lose all the nutrients, you lose the grass species, and with that, the ability to, to harbor not only livestock, but this this amazing amount of biodiversity. So th this picture shows that we actually keep large parts of Naibosho closed for grazing to create grass banks um, and also sea banks, which is a very critical part as well, um, that in this picture that you see here, there's probably about 30 to 35 different species of grasses in there. Uh, as opposed to in some of the more overgrazed areas, you'll be looking at only four to five different species of grass. So the, having constant monitoring and management is, is, a, is a major part of the success here. Um, this also shows that with our, our staff, our field staff, we have 80 plus people in the field, 63 of them are rangers. This is um, one of 13 elephants we've treated on Abosho alone in the last year. None of these elephants have been um, wounded from wildlife, uh, human wildlife um, conflict on Naibosha. They've all come in from outside. Um, but we've just had the ability, along with KWS and Mara Elephant um, Project, uh, to, to attend to them. Um, and and the, the, this shows the problem of space. We need to keep this space, these corridors open. Um, and and to keep the grass banks there. In fact, an elephant will graze more than it will browse if there is grass. So it, there's less tree damage. If you were an elephant and you walked off into another area where there's a juicy maize field, what are you going to do? You're going to go in there. And what's the land again, uh, owner going to do? Is going to retaliate. And that's where we get wounded elephants, um, spears and arrows mainly. They're not poaching. They're this... Um, warding uh, the, the elephants off, but it becomes a, a problem. Um, so the more we can um, create space um, and and inter uh, connectivity between the conservancies, there's nothing stopping these elephants going all the way to the Serengeti or any of the wildlife. Um, and that that's critical. This is just more sort of gory, gory stuff that we've dealt with. But, and, on, and here's a good, is a feel good picture. Um, and if anyone from Kenya Bird of Prey Trust, I think Lemaine joined earlier. Um, you know, we work really closely with other conservation groups. Um, we have now um, a vulture holding pen um, for wounded or poison vultures um, on Naibosho. And a few of our rangers are trained specially to handle things like a lappet face vulture. It's not as simple as what Sio Lolo, the man who's holding the vulture there, looks like. It, <laughs> it takes it takes a bit of experience, um, otherwise you might get a nasty nip. But uh, we're, you know, we're constantly involved in managing the ecosystem. Um, so I'll go on to, um, unless you want to add to that, Dixon, um, what you know, what we've created is a world class cons conservancy and and continues the the fact that there's such a high level of tourism, um, but also through the scientific data we get back we know we're doing a good job but it does come with challenges so um did you want to add to any of the biodiversity element or should we just go straight into some of the challenges here dixon you're muted sorry because i think i'm muted um because i've seen a question from um, somebody talking about livestock, because I did mention that, you know, for the last 13 years, we've been having an issue of more, an increase of more than a thousand livestock every year, uh, based on the data and the numbers. And uh, that question was, um, are the people really going to think about, you know, not affecting the ecology by thinking about that limit? You know, as 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 part of the biodiversity conservation that we are doing as a conservancy, we are engaging the people, we are engaging the community, we are engaging the landowners to agree with us on matters of current capacity. And this is a positive stride because the community today, when you get to them, you know, in their local gatherings, 
everybody is thinking about the numbers are too high and we should think about reducing them. So this is something that is top, top of our table and Alistair and I are busy working on it and all the other conservancy managers in the Mara landscape because it, it's a cross-cutting problem, not only in Abosho Conservancy, even the Maasai Mara Game Reserve. So this is something that all of us are thinking about it and we are working on it. And as an Abosho Conservancy, as an Conservancy Management, we think that it will be positive because the people are already discussing, I'm one of the landowners, and I, I, this, is, this is my conversation on a daily basis with the people, with the community, and people are positive. So we are working about it. So um, maybe Alistair, are you going to handle the challenges or? Myself? Yeah, let's, um, I think based on, we need to give some time on Q&A and you and I also need to get back to work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think the biggest um, conservation challenge, um, and that's globally is population increase uh, in the Mara landscape, obviously being you know very tied to livestock ownership that's both human and livestock population increase that that just creates more pressure for land um so Dixon we touched on that uh, just now is that that is one of the largest thing uh, aspects that both Dixon and I manage is is livestock and and uh manage um livestock numbers and and trying to get the community to understand that there is a limit um, um and we need to all address that together um so overgrazing or overstocking um has been an issue it continues to be an issue as, as dixon mentioned earlier that one of the conservation benefits was the community gets money one of the conservation i wouldn't say backfires is what did the community do with that money is buy more livestock so there is a turning point now. You've got to understand that these conservancies have been relatively young still. Um, and what there needs to be more of an understanding of um, how to better manage the rangeland to, the, to, to, to create a more balanced environment for, for, for both wildlife and, and humans. Not an easy task, because I'll show you a map in a minute. Climate change is one that I think we're all aware of um, and don't really need to, to dwell on, but we're all impacted here. We get long periods of drought, and then we're expecting some epic rain in the next few months, whether it comes or not. We need to be ready for that. We need to know that moving forward, there is less reliance on traditional weather patterns, um, so we, we, we need to cater for um, long periods of drought. That comes again back to livestock management, providing water. We're about to um, increase our water catchment uh, or holding capacity to have year-round water. Um, earlier this year, in fact, it got so dry on Nabosha that there was only two standing pools of water, and that created a, a huge amount of pressure for, for the livestock and, and the wildlife. So, and then when it does rain, what are we going to do? You know, it's actually utilize the fact that it's raining to prevent further erosion, to catch more water, to where areas where we're restoring land is to let that properly regenerate. Um, another challenge is, you know, again, it's linked to population um, is the biodiversity loss. So it's it's where... If there is any imbalance, nature is very fragile at the same time as being very resilient, is that if you create a small imbalance, it can affect so many different um, species. And so we need to make sure that we, we, we create an environment where imbalance is, is less of a, of a threat. And that can happen very quickly. It can be one weevil infestation. Um, that's no one's fault, but just part of climate change, or it can be overgrazing, which is something we can we can control more on the ground, but all tied together. And I'll show you some pictures now of, of what can happen with overgrazing. Um, financial resilience on the conservancies is is critical. We rely on tourism, but because we've created a, a, a extraordinary uh, haven for wildlife and biodiversity in general is that um, we know that there is more support from international conservation groups to, to keep that going. So, um, you know, tourism is the mainstay. Um, 
But if that goes away, what are we going to do? We do have backup plans. We do have, you know, we are in contact already. We have created a resilience fund that will be up to a million dollars by the time it is um, in the next three years we'd have reached. And that, that fund will be only used to pay leases. Um, so there are mechanisms in, in place already to diversify the revenue. Um, this, this next map shows actually where there is is a fence, a map showing all the fences. That's my more show here. Um, you you had a talk with Jackson last week about part of Matt, um, and I know that he he discussed the, the challenges of fences. But just look at the increase. Um, this is over the last uh, ten to fifteen years. Uh, Twenty years ago, there were very few fences in in in, in this particular area. The, having these conservancies shows that it has held back that push. What has happened here is it's very understandable. If you own a piece of land, you're going to put up a fence. Um, but what it's done is cut off corridors, the loiter migration being probably the most, um, the wildebeest migration of the loiter, um, many of you would know, um, has basically died. But here, coming into the reserve, we've created corridors that allows movement and then across, across all the other conservancies. Eventually, there's going to be some delineation. There's no doubt about that. But in the meantime, instead of this all being fences, if these hadn't been conservancies here, this will all be red fences, to give you a perspective. So this also shows this next slide um, where we manage grazing. This left-hand slide, um, where, where the laser is now, is an area of the conservancy that's heavily overgrazed compared to on this side. These two uh, pictures were taken at the same time of year that had the same amount of rainfall, the same soil types, but look at the difference in the landscape. This has had um, many years of overgrazing, particularly sheep and a very border of the conservancy, but it's going to be very difficult for that to uh, regenerate if we don't step in there now and manage that and close off portions of it to grazing. That said, the Mara is extremely resilient. Out of all um, the rangeland um, ecosystems in, 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 in Africa, the Mara is probably one of the most forgiving and productive. But um, it just shows that it can be fragile. Here's another example of erosion gullies. We're all very familiar with these in Kenya um, and elsewhere in Africa or in the world, in fact, is that once they start, they, they don't stop themselves. So we need to control that. This was a result from an old road that had been compacted and then including livestock um, overgrazing so that when it does rain, the water doesn't permeate into the soil. It runs across the surface into these erosion gullies and it just gets worse. In our protected areas where there's long grass and there's a high level of um, you know, top, uh, top cover is that you don't get that. We don't have any erosion in, 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 our, in our core area at all. Um, this also shows we do, although it says 2022, we do have quite um, complicated um, grazing zones, depending on the time of year. But this shows a map of, you know, each of these areas that I'm pointing at with the laser is, in fact, a grazing block from eight different community zones and a, a large part of Dixon. And I, um, my job is to see where there is grass availability and assess where next the cattle can be can be can be moving around, um, <clears throat> and it, with this climate change, said there's a long period of drought. Some of the times this gets high pressure from extra grazing, and then people want to move into the core area. So we we police that. Sometimes we let we let uh, cattle in. Sometimes we don't. Um, but that's all part of the management. It, but I just wanted to show you that we do have a grazing plan. There there is not just letting cattle in every morning and then. Um, out there to go in the evening, grazing wherever they want. It's a very controlled environment. My computer's quammer. Um Let it, let it um, digest. Okay, so the future of Naboshu, I think we can cover this together, Dixon, um, yeah. because we talked about the benefits a lot and also how it's been so great for you know a conservation success for wildlife um is the vision is to grow the community and conservation model across the greater Mara ecosystem 
to create one large protected area. Um, and underlined is that the communities depend um, can rely on an income from. Um, we do need to create a more sustainable balance between wildlife and livestock. Um, at the same time, that enhances the tourism product without putting any additional pressure on the ecosystem. So we don't want to be like the National Reserve. We don't want it to be that where it's become infamous for um you know, just a, a slew of different operators and 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 basically a really badly managed environment. Um, that with the, the the conservancies are able to um, create a, a product um, that is got integrity. Um, so because of that, that that ensures the longevity of diversifying this financial commitment, both from tourism and the the conservation sector. Um, that is of huge value globally. Um, we, it's really special place. Anyone that's been to Naibosho and driven around, um, it's actually awe-inspiring. Uh, and, 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 and it makes you realize that we need to protect this because it's so unique. Um, once that goes, it's very hard to bring it back um, without it being fortress conservation or um, something a little bit more. Let, let, this is wild. This is how it was. And, and we, can, we can do even better. Um, like reintroduced species that used to be in my father's generation, you know, he'd say when I was down there, it was black rhino in every croton thicket, and I and I and I know that's true. Um, we may get black rhino back. Southern patas monkey is another one that used to be in Nabosho. There's now only 200 left in the world, and they're in the Serengeti, but they used to be on Nabosho, Nabosho as, as as recently as 2016. So it shows that we need to continue with this biodiversity um, input, the, the importance of that and, and managing the land so that, who knows, in the next 10 years, we might get Southern Patas monkey back. Uh, that would be a conservation coup. Um, so, um, you know, to creating this conservation model that the next generation, we've talked a lot about 25 years, we need to be able to think further um, how about for another 25 years or more? How about or forever? This this place is so valuable um, that it will always be um, a haven for wildlife that is community owned. It's not a national park. It's not a reserve. It's not something that's been fenced off. That that, that this is this has created a basically a, a model that conservation pays, and may, long may that live. Um, because it can disappear fast. So, you know, I think that's the end of our talk, essentially, and Dixon can add to that. And as, as Dixon adds to that, I'm just yeah, going to me... show through some pictures here. Um, of Everyone is taken by one of our rangers. It just shows that, you know, I, I love the fact that we, we have, you know, 63 rangers in the field. Um, we created a WhatsApp group last year for security reasons. Um, for us to be able to communicate internally. And I'd say 95% of the communication on there now is um, us sharing pictures of amazing wildlife sightings. <laughs> so, you know, we've got five cheetah cubs right now that we're protecting heavily and getting great collaboration from the guides on. Uh, there's leopard cub, there's four, five different prides with lion cubs right now. Um, so it, it just, instead of... Um, Grabbing pictures, and we do have an Instagram account. Um, I think it's Nightwatcher Conservancy. Um, pictures of we get a lot of famous photographers that come on here, but everything I'll show you next, or as Dixon speaks, is taken by rangers just doing their job. And I think that's fantastic that they have this level of um, um, proudness of, of why, why, you know, why they're on the conservancy. So Dixon, go, go for it. And then yeah, thank you so much. I just maybe to mention one point before we open it for Q and A is that as, 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 as one of, you know, as we think about the future of Nabosho conservancy, we're thinking of, uh, you know, reducing the number of livestock to the requisite, um, you know, number that we can accommodate as a conservancy, that's 8,000. That's the much that we can without degrading land, without interfering with, you know, the biodiversity that we are talking about. So as a conservancy, we've always been thinking like, what is the value of livestock? 
what is the revenue that the community and the landowners are getting from livestock keeping? We are doing the maths, we are doing the analysis, and then also we are opening up questions and thinking, is there a possibility of the conservation model providing to the people, you know, the revenue that they are supposed to be getting from livestock for us to be able to think about the current capacity, for us to reduce the number of livestock to 8,000 only, so that as we engage the community to reduce the number of livestock, we are able as a conservancy to provide, you know, with equal measure, the revenue that they're supposed to be getting through livestock. So this is something that as we think about the future of the conservancy, it's top of our minds. We're thinking on a daily basis, we're engaging stakeholders, we're engaging people to think about this so that we see whether we can provide. And that is, that will be the, the, the lasting solution, you know, for us to be able to manage, um, you know, for us to be able to, to manage our biodiversity as well as providing, you know, um, you, know you know, the, the requisite um, uh, revenue to, to the people. Yeah, so otherwise, thank you so much. Um, that was, um, you know, our presentation. Uh, and I think we are now open to back to Sile or someone else to guide us through Q&A. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alistair. Thank you so much, Dixon. That was a really, really incredible talk. Fascinating to learn about all the amazing work that you guys are doing. And Abosho, and just those last pictures there that you were scrolling through, Alistair, absolutely loved that. I loved hearing about the pride that your rangers have in the, their environment and the work they're doing there. And great photos as well. A really incredible one of that kind of, uh, I don't, not a herd of giraffe, but I mean, I've never seen so many giraffe in the same place. So that was really incredible. Um, yeah, go back to it. So everyone can know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, if anyone's got a question on that picture, that's something to be discussed. But yeah, it's an incredible tower. Yeah, you know. tower. There we go. Great, great name for it. <laughs> Um, okay, so we are going to start with the Q&A now. I see there's lots of questions coming in in the chat. Um, Stuart Thompson was the first person to ask a question. And I'm wondering, Stuart, if you'd like to actually unmute and ask your question first. Uh, thanks, fellas. As always, I'm, I, th I should explain to the those listening in that I know Nabosho very well, having been collecting data there collaboratively with the, the management group there since 2016. Um, but my question was about leases. I mean, you've got phenomenal take up of uh, lease agreements, 95 percent, I think you said, Dixon. I just wondered why the other five haven't signed up. Is it because of their land is very strate strategically placed or is there some other compounding factor in play? Yeah, maybe um, I'll mention that the five percent. Because you see people don't move, even the other one, when we signed for 15 years. At the first start, we signed around 60%. And up to, you know, people went signing slowly, slowly, and then we transited 100%. But for this, in this scenario, you know, people have some bit of reservation, one or two people probably. And you're wanting to see whether they can acquire some bit of land outside there to permit also and reside for a further period of, you know, for, for the next 25 years. But as a conservancy, we're also providing that alternative. We're providing what we call the host parcels. Nabucho Conservancy has hired close to 150, close to another 2,000 acres outside. That is not part of this. That is not part of the conservancy to be used, you know, as, as host parcel. You know, this is where that you can commit also to reside permanently without any interference for another 25 years, as long as you provided, you've committed your land to conservation. So these are, these is, people have different ideas, different things, but the conservancy is addressing them individually so that people are coming to the office. It was like, maybe last month, it was like 92%. Today it is 93%. So it is a continuous process. process. People signing land, people will not just wake up in the morning and sign 100%. So maybe next month it will be 96. Then by the time that, because they'll have two years, they still have two years in 15 years. So by, we are hoping that by the expiry of the next two years, they will have transited to 25%. Great. Thank you for that, Dixon. Um, 
Okay, we do have still quite a few more questions in the chat, but I'd love to hear from our primary audience. Um, Gertrude, if you're there with the students, um, please could you unmute yourself and then we can hear the questions from your class. Okay. My question is, my name is Samson Said, and I have a question. I have seen some of the challenges facing Nabosho, being human on life conflict. Uh, I've seen you have a you have a mitigation measure that you there are some of the challenges and the mitigation measures that you have already used, like compensation schedule that you have introduced that that curb human on life conflicts. You have also had a measure of uh, mitigating of aggressing, like introduction of grazing plan. So the question is, there is this challenge of population increase. What is the mitigation measure that you are planning as conservation managers, maybe to use in the future to reduce the population pressure? Shall I take that one, Dixon? Yeah, thank you so much, um, Samson Soich, for that quite very important question. Um, you know, we might not control populations. <laughs> because exactly. uh, that is way beyond what we can do as a conservancy. But what we are doing also is we've been increasing land. Um, you know, even this year, I think we increased close to 2,000 acres already, trying to protect more land into conservation. And uh, also trying to talk to the community to, you know, remain within the settlement areas that we've already identified, um, you know, for them not to really, you know, give us a lot of pressure into the already conserved area. So what you are doing basically is adding more land into conservation because, um, you know, we don't have the ability to control populations. The reason why we are adding more land, you know, is for us to be able to control you know, issues of, you know, industrialization and all that, or people coming up with various structures and, uh, you know, things that may not go well with the already existing conservation model in the matter. And something else that we're doing is through the, you know, National Environmental Management Authority, you know, is to make sure that no development will be done next to the conservancy without the conservancy approval. Otherwise, somebody might come up with, you know, a weighed idea that interferes with, you know, the 700 people way of life. So, you know, they have to be respected with their business. They have to be respected with, with, with what we are doing. Otherwise, with matters of population increase, you know, we cannot have that particular idea. Another thing is by also trying to provide, you know, we are providing revenue, we are providing employment, we are providing education you know, by talking to the community that as much as we are in, increasing in population, but can the majority of us, can the same increased population have a positive mindset towards population? Otherwise, if we start ha have, having, uh, you know, an increased population of people having a negatively configured mind towards conservation, then we'll have a problem. But with the increased population and people thinking posi positively about the efforts that you're putting to conserve biodiversity, and improving the people livelihood, then I think it will not be like a negative, uh, will not have some negative effects. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dixon. Um, thank you for that question, Samson. Gertrude, do you have any more questions on your side? Yes. We have one more. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. My name is Victor. Uh, this is not a question, but to answer a question which uh, Alista has said before, that what amount of grass a, a cow should feed or in a day? So this is a question that I've been searching for a long time. The other time I've been searching while I'm doing holistic management in a non conservancy, and uh, I find that a cow will feed a uh, 10 kg of its weight. That's let's say a nomadism cow, but for dairy cows, they usually feed on 
they shall feed about 15 kgs of its weight. So I think Alisa will do more for us or tell us more about that. Thank no. you. Good answer. And it's encouraging to know that, that um, you're more or less correct. But knowing this, you know, I used to ask this question last year, very few people would know. How much grass do we need to support the amount of livestock that's on Nabosho now? Um, including with the wildlife. So the next question would be, how much grass does a Thompson gazelle need to eat? And how many Thompson gazelles do we have? So this, this all combines with uh, wildlife monitoring and keeping a very close eye on our, our grass health. So you could say right now, Nambosha needs around 350,000 metric tons of grass a year just to support the wildlife that we have on, on, on the conservancy. The reality is we don't have that amount of new growth every year, especially with erratic weather. So we need to plan. The, the previous question was about population. Now, we can't control human population, something we have to accept. We, we, it's just getting busier. But with the conservancy boundaries as they are, and making sure that the corridors are in place, that the um, the population, human population, can increase, but it doesn't mean that 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 is a threat to the conservancy uh, boundaries. We are increasing where where we not where we're not. It's not a land grab, but when people come to us and say, "Can we be part of Nabosha?" We look at where their land is, and if it's a, a, applicable, we'll join them to the fold. The, you know, especially if it's bordering and creating more corridors. The wild uh, livestock population we can more or less control through. There has to be landowner buy-in for for the start, and a lot of that comes from education and understanding what are we dealing with here. Um, it's not sustainable in some parts of the conservancy and other parts of the Mara ecosystem. That needs to change. That that's one of the biggest threats. So, um, and I think Hugh Gibbon put up. I know Hugh's still on here. You look at other parts of Kenya. Um, you know the effect of overgrazing is is significant. It's very hard to reverse that. So what we do is we have this controlled grazing. We have areas where there's no grazing at all. Um, and we're firm believers of that if conservation pays, um, that there's less need for livestock to pay for a livelihood. So, um, you know, in time, what we didn't mention is that each year the lease payment increases. Uh, it's a set formula of compounded interest. Um, so it, 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 what that does, it creates a mechanism for basically um, believing in the fact that you will have a guaranteed income. Um, but in return, you need to look carefully at your natural resources. So this, this 10, 10, 15, 10 is about the, you know, that's for a cow to survive on, depending on the grass species. Average is around 15 kgs, you are right. Um, add that up to, we had 17,000 head of cattle on our last census in June. That's how much grass is being eaten a day. On the conservancy so when you start putting numbers uh, the reality becomes a lot more um can be quite alarming yeah absolutely well thank you very much for that alistair and thank you as well dixon for your for your for remembering that alistair asked that question in the beginning um and well done for getting it right that's way off my estimate but it is incredibly interesting and a very important thing to start thinking about so um, we've got some really interesting comments from Emmanuel in the chat. Um, I'll just read them out for you. He says, if it pays, it stays. Um, so obviously wildlife conservation must be able to compete against other land use options for sustainability and also presumably um, income. And uh, Emmanuel also says he's very happy to learn about what Nebosha, what, what Nebosha means, um, which I'm so, sure we all are really significant that it means coming together. Um, and then um, Emmanuel has also asked another question. He's asking about how um, how do you promote connectivity between the, your conservancy and other connected conservancies in the ecosystem for the benefit of the pastoral Maasai members and the wildlife who use seasonal migrations for survival? There's a lot of there's a lot of communication between the conservancies, and a lot a lot of that is through organisations like the um, MMWCA, 
um, the Maasai the Maasai Mara Conservancy Wildlife Con Wildlife Conservancies Association. Um, they're an umbrella organization based out of Aitong um, that that facilitate communication and connectivity. Um, we talk a lot with the other conservancies, um, and a lot of that is based on livestock um, issues. Um, so we're not just pushing cows around from one conservancy to another, but also the fact that, you know, the um, Padamat's a great example um, where a lot of our giraffe go onto Padamat. We've just tagged three giraffe uh, two weeks ago to learn more about where they go on Padamat um, exactly. And and we don't we didn't know that no no one could actually know that unless you literally followed those giraffe around day and night. So um, keeping that connectivity, there's a common goal, and I think we started with that in the beginning. Is this greater Mara ecosystem, um, and and it's a significant chunk of land. And as you said, if it pays, it stays, and that's the critical component to factor in here. It's got to pay. The minute it doesn't it becomes vulnerable. Now, Dick, I don't know if you want to add to that. I think it's, it's fine now. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so we do have a question in the chat from Hugh Gibbon. I think sadly he has dropped out of the chat, but I think it's an interesting question that we'd all like to know the answer to. Um, so obviously the basis for your model is developing a sustainable landscape. And um, you mentioned that you had an increased livestock about a thousand per year over the last 13 years. Um, so at some point, obviously landowners are going to have to accept a limit on either purchasing new cattle or the grazing of additional cattle. So how do you manage that? Yeah, I think I I responded on that yeah. by saying that, um, you know, as a conservancy, we are engaging the community. And, uh, you know, you can already hear by what Alistair, the question that he started asking with, you know, uh, to the people on how many, how much, you know, does an average cow eats by year? You know, that's part of the conversation, conversation because first you need to identify that how many, that's how you calculate carrying capacity because you need to calculate on the number, on the amount of grass that you need, you know, that you that you produce as a conservancy and how many livestock do you, are you able to sustain per year without degrading land and affecting biodiversity? So that's how, you know, the number earlier was came at, you know, at 8,000. So we are engaging the people, we are talking to the community you know, this is a conversation that might not end. And I'm happy today because part of the audience are, you know, the students of Wildlife Tourism College. You know, these students are landowners, these students are people from this community, and they can also be ambassadors of conservation. And these are the people who are also getting the fruits of conservation already, and, uh, you know, through leases and grass and all that. So this is a continuous, um, you know, conversation that has been going on. And I did mention that it is quite very positive. People are already thinking positively. If you were to come to the man size like um, 20 years ago and tell them that we need to reduce the number of livestock because they're way too high, people will not listen to you. But today they initiate the conversations. Today they are positive about it because, you know, climate change is real. Everybody is being adversely affected. And, um, you know, people already realizing that, you know, you will get the, the, you know, old men today in the village telling you, you know, at time like this, you know, during May and, uh, you know, and April of every year, we used to receive this amount of rainfall. You know, today we are not getting it. So it's quite very real. And I want to say that uh, the community is positive about it. And, uh, you know, we are all working together as a landscape. This is a landscape problem. It's not about Nabucho Conservancy Challenge. It's about the entire landscape. Education okay. is a big one. That, yes. um, so, so, yeah. you know, that rather than leave it till it gets so bad that people have no choice then to reduce their livestock because there's literally nothing left to eat. Um, we're finding that education and awareness is, is massively important. The more of that we can get that's hands-on. It's not sitting in a classroom just looking at diagrams and pie charts of what could happen and what we should be doing, it's getting your hands dirty and, and understanding what we're dealing with here. So we are about to start a more, um, hopefully, um, 
rangeland management um, course from at WTC discussions are, are, are ongoing right now that um, once you understand what you're dealing with, um, people realize that it's not sustainable um, in a large part of the Mara ecosystem. And so um, to Hugh's, um, to, to answer Hugh is to, is like, it's a lot of work. It's probably one of the most controversial subjects to be dealing with, but um, it, it is being addressed um, and, and it is working in, 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 in a lot of cases, people are in fact reducing livestock because they, they realize they just can't keep up um, scratching around looking for grazing when it's dry. And yes, there's a cultural aspect to keeping livestock with the, with the Maasai, but the younger generation are, are saying, yeah, we'll still have livestock, but we don't need as, ma as much. Um, and and that, that's a really important first step. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Alistair. You took the words right out of my mouth. I think education is absolutely the key. You can't sort of go to someone and say you can't have that many cows, but not explain why. And I think um, education is so important in all of conservation as well um, to help people understand uh, why and not just what you have to do. So thank you so much for that. Um, Stuart, I see you've got your hand raised. Do you want to unmute and make a comment or ask a question? Am I there? Yep, you're there. Oh, must have we speeded up a bit on this side. <laughs> I'm. I want to ask what might be a little bit of an awkward question, really, of both of you. Um, you showed from your <clears throat> your map work how your conservancy is contiguous with all of the other conservancies in the network. Why do you think they've not been able to emulate the? impact quite and i'm thinking about biodiversity impact here that you've been able to achieve i think some of them have Stu. um well, i'm just going back to that map you know some of these other conservancies are quite um new and you look at um nrl for example i mean that was pivot irrigation around five years ago i remember that um you know now it's different. Uh, it takes a bit of time for it all to bounce back again. I'm just going back to that original where we are. Um, by virtue of being close to the National Reserve, I mean, Nabosh already had a high wildlife uh, population, um, but it's, it's it's critical that you look at Alaria Rock, Mara North, um, Old Kenya as well. They, they, we all have pressure with livestock, but... Um, you know, because they're older conservancies, that they've just had a chance for the wildlife. If you talk to people, in fact, even when you started doing your monitoring, how um, shy the lion were compared to where, what, what we're dealing with now, where they literally don't care if a car drives um, close to them. Um, in fact, we even have to manage that. Um, that the 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 the, the, animal, the wildlife behavior has not only changed because they realize they're in a safe place, they're not going to get speared or harassed um I, I think your question is why the others come you know come to the same level given management and time they will and that's the whole objective with the with the, the sort of the greater mara ecosystem in itself is uh nra is a great example of that it wasn't a conservancy a year a, a, what, two years ago um and now it is yeah, well, obviously, I know NRA very well because I've set up some monitoring there too. But I just wonder whether you think sort of size of conservancy has any influence. I mean, you have you have a relatively large one compared to a lot within the in the network. Yeah, I think size in terms of management does make a difference. But again, look at the map here. It's you know, it's all we all border each other. Um, keeping those corridors open in a wildlife uh, context is down here we have Olorai and then there's there's um Nashulai as well um very small conservancies but a lot of our wildlife moves in and out of, of those areas or into Olaria rock there's cheetah that, that you saw sitting in the rain often move between us onto Nabosha and Old Kine, um is that I don't think it's so much about size it's more about um the collaboration between the other conservancies that we create 
these havens uh, for wildlife. The way that I look at it is that, yeah, there's no bosho, but actually we're just part of a much bigger area here. Um, and and it, it's really important for us to collaborate more with our neighbors to make sure that um, their wildlife can come onto us and vice versa. I, I don't think it's about the size, but definitely the fact that we can, say, manage a core area where there's no grazing and we have more than 100 lion on Nabosha right now, uh, that's including cubs. Um, so, it, um, but we have a very high density of lion. It would be great if those lion dispersed more into places like Padamat, um, so that we don't have um, complications from, um, you know, too high a density. It's possible we could have too many lion. Yeah. I've, I've got another question, if if I may, CL. Yeah, go for it. One more quick question. And then uh, sadly, we only have the WTC students until for another 15 minutes. So I think one more question from you, cool. Stuart, and then we'll close out. It's just, it's a very conservation biologist led question. You propose somewhere in your presentation, the prospect of black rhino and patus monkey in mm -hmm. Nabosho. Um, I think I would die a happy man if I saw either of those in there. Um, re but the the black rhino intrigues me because um the world over that or the, the continent over that owns black and white rhino they sort of jump in ship really in terms of um setting up conservation programs around them because they're expensive and very difficult to police i just wondered whether you know what the reality of black rhino in nabosho might be yeah it's a it's a good one that you know I was in the Economist last week there uh, or two weeks ago that you know a rhino is more valuable dead than it is alive these days. Um, you know, there's especially in southern Africa that that you've got a situation where there's been such constant great con conservation success surrounding rhino, particularly white rhino, um, that you know that there's almost an oversupply. Um, in Kenya, it's very different, as you know. We all wildlife is owned by by the the national government KWS. Um, is Naibosho and uh, large parts of the Mara um, an ideal habitat? And were black rhino thriving there? Yes, it would just be nice to get it back. Unfortunately, it would have to be very controlled in the beginning, where they would be like they did on Lewa in the beginning. You sort of start off with five thousand acres, and you have to fence them in and secure that, and eventually get the um, a, a larger area um in play um you know actually looking at Lewa is a, a great example where it used to just be literally around around where Anna Hunt, and it's where the you know sort of three to five thousand acres and now it's fifty five thousand acres and now it includes barana then those rhino can go all the way to yeah to the lol digers if they want um it's it's about having that connectivity. It's very possible. I think we're a ways off yet to having black rhino, patus monkeys. Yeah, be awesome. Um, we we just need to um, lure them back again or work with the various groups that are primatologists to say, look, we have a safe haven. Why did they disappear in the first place? Let's make sure that they don't again. But uh, if you talk to people that knew this area 60 years ago, and they'll bring out a map and say, not only did we have patus monkeys here, 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 and here, like here, here, and here. Um, there were greater kudu along here. There were uh, and greater kudu along here. There are giant forest hog, and you know, there's a whole slew of different species that you just don't see anymore, including even roan antelope along this ridge up here. So it's you know, it's something that. As a biologist and a conservationist, I'd also love to, I would die a happy man if that was the case. But yeah, rhinos take a lot of money um, to to secure and protect, but um, we certainly have the habitat for it. So many questions I could ask, but thank you very much, fellas. And um, I think the data would probably say you're being a bit modest. Your Nabosho is a, is a real role model in terms of what, all conservancies can aspire to, I think. So well done to the, you and all of your teams. You're doing a great job. Thanks, you. Um. Yeah, thank you for that, Stuart. I completely agree. I very much echo those sentiments. And I think everybody that was in the audience today will agree 
fantastic work that you guys are doing. And uh, we do sort of have to wrap up now. So I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you so much, Alistair. Thank you so much, Dixon, for giving us your time. I know you're vo both very, very busy. Um, so we really, really appreciate it. I'm sure the students at WTC really appreciate, appreciate it as well. Um, as I mentioned before, these um, recordings will be available on our website and on YouTube as well to watch sort of forevermore. Um, Stu, I've put uh, a link in the group chat for and for everyone else as well to the Share Screen Africa video presentations where you can watch not just this video, but also the other ones in the series and our other series from Share Screen. Um, so thank you both very, very much. Thank you again so much to the Wildlife Tourism College students there and the volunteers and the staff because they are the ones who allowed us to put on this series and also um, have this talk available for the wider audience. And which brings me to my final thank you, which is the wider audience, our share screen audience. We have a great number of people like you, Stuart, who always come every week to these series and we really, really appreciate that. Appreciate that. We love our, our little community that we're building around these and to be able to have these really great discussions. So thank you all so much. Um, thank you very much from me as well. And I'm going to say uh, asanteni, ashe oleng, and goodbye to everyone. <laughs>